So today we're going to look at uh, at rabies and um, we'll define it, uh, look at epidemiology, transmission, pathophysiology, up until prevention and control. So as we all know, rabies is basically a vaccine preventable uh, disease that is zoonotic, mostly passed on from animals. And once the signs and symptoms uh, start manifesting, we normally have almost 100% uh, fatality rate. So in terms of uh, spread, uh, so rabies is mostly found in uh, Asia and Africa with a very few cases reported in uh, like Antarctica. So these are uh, neglected tropical disease that is commonly found in uh, the third world. And um, the population that is normally affected is children under the age of 15. Um, so rural areas bear the brunt mostly uh, more than urban setups. So as you can see in this uh, map of the world, the Asia area is significantly affected in Africa and some patches of, um, of South America with very minimal cases in um, Europe and um, Americas. Okay, so in terms of the agent that causes this disease, uh, we know it's caused by the rabies virus, which falls under the family of Rhabdoviridae uh, uh, and also the genus is Lysavirus. So Rhabdoviridae is, um, is a Greek name for rod-shaped kind of uh, viruses, and you can see they look like bullets, yeah? So that is the shape of Rhabdoviruses. Uh, and... Uh, the rabies virus is a single-stranded RNA virus. So in terms of transmission, uh, mostly uh, we get this, as we said, it's a zoonotic disease. So we, may, we mostly get it from animals. So wild animals that are reservoirs for this kind of virus include jackals, mongoose, hyenas, uh, but that can also be passed on to um, domestic animals like dogs and cats. So the transmission mostly is via bites and for human transmission, dogs account to the highest uh, amount of transmission or the cases that we have in human beings. So normally it is, it is passed on by a uh, bite or if somebody comes into contact with the saliva of a rabbit animal, okay? And then this one starts going into the body up until it affects the nervous system. So in terms of how it actually happens is that you get a bite, then this bite, uh, you get an inoculation of the virus the virus starts multiplying in the muscles around the area you've got in the bite. Then um, this, is, this one is passed from the muscles to the peripheral nerve by the neuromuscular junction. And in the nerve, that is where now multiple and multiple uh, replication happens. And it passes on from the peripheral nerve to the central nervous system. Once it gets to the central nervous system, it is now passed back to other, to autonomic uh, nerves, to other organs, including the salivary gland, where ideally, the virus does this for protective, uh, for to perpetuate uh, its its, its um, existence, because ideally it should be passed on to other hosts uh, through the saliva. Okay, then um, the transmission is supposed to continue once it is passed to the salivary gland, because now the saliva can be passed on to some other host. Yes. Okay, so in terms of the incubation period, it it it, it has a wide range because we clearly don't have a defined a specific time. So people put it at, uh, scientists put it at between two weeks and one year, but uh, typically it takes a couple of months between we, before the, we start having the signs and symptoms um, of, of, of rabies. However, this depends on certain factors and that's why we have the huge variability. Things like the doses, the dosage of the virus, basically the viral load from the animal that has bitten you, the size of the wound or the bite, then uh, distance of the wound from the brain. So if you get a bite, for example, at the clavicle area or at the back, for example, you, when you get a bite from a bat, and um, that will be different from when you get a bite from a dog at the lower limb. So we know at the back or near the clavicle area, it's just near the, the brain. So that individual host factors like immunity uh, and other factors might play a role in how fast it progresses. So rabies can progress in, first of all, you can have the first, the early stages symptoms uh, like fever, headache, such kind of uh, signs and symptoms, which are not classical or specific to rabies. However, from there, we'll have two distinct forms that are classical for rabies. That is furious rabies. It's normally seen in 80% of the cases and then paralytic rabies are, are seen less more often. 
Uh, so the abdominal features include now what we've talked about, what we see in the very early stages, fever, headache, nausea, vomiting, and such like uh, symptoms. Then we have furious rabies, which include now agitation. This is because now the, the, the virus is clearly affecting the nerves and the speci specifically the brain, the central nervous system. Then you have inflammation, the encephalitis. Then you start having the CNS signs and symptoms like seizure, hallucination, um, all these uh, signs and symptoms. Then hydrophobia uh, is a classical feature for rabies. And this normally occurs when you start having painful contractions of the diaphragm or uh, of the diaphragm and also respiratory muscles, including the laryngeal muscles. So this uh, is uh, an important thing to know because even just even just taking in your saliva or taking in water, it will be expelled uh, violently, okay, uh, by the painful contraction. So that is the hydrophobia that occurs. We might also have some some um, stimulation still of the laryngeal muscles and uh, that area with just a draft of air. So that is what we call aerophobia. So later on, we might have other complications like cardiac failure, respiratory failure, and um, that and multi, multiple organ uh, failure. So the paralytic rabies form, as we say, it occurs in almost 20%, where you start having paralysis, especially from the area that has been beaten. But this can also lead to other things uh, like coma, uh, death. In very few cases, we have a recovery. Okay, so this is just showing the progression um, of the disease. So from the time that you get the disease, you, from the time you start showing the signs and symptoms, we, we, we now know that death is almost certain. So you only take a few days, uh, less than a week, and death will be uh, inevitable. So in terms of uh, contact, we said contact with uh, the saliva. So we can have different categories of contact, like category one, which we, we call it no exposure. Basically, they're just touching or feeding of animals, but you have an intact skin. So the animal is leaking you, so the saliva is there, but we have an intact skin. So very little chance of you actually getting the, the virus. Then you have category two, where we call it an exposure category. So the skin is a bit uncovered or you have minor scratches or abrasion. And then you have now an animal coming into contact with you uh, or leaking you. Then where we have severe exposure in category three, where you have a, like huge bites or scratches, okay, or a very huge broken skin. And then you have the saliva of the animal. So this, this categorization is important, especially for knowing um, um, like what, what management will do. Like for from category two and three, uh, post exposure uh, rabies vaccination is important. Actually, it's mandatory. But for category one, we really don't need to give you a vaccine uh, for that. So diagnosis is quite difficult um, because we might not in the early stages we might not be able to pick it. Uh, but just having a proper history of the exposure will be good. However, that is a bit tricky because in some some bites. We might get like for bats, it's the, the, the bites are quite small. You might not be able to really know. Then physical examination and then investigation that will include the serum and uh, cerebrospinal fluid analysis. Management, uh, there's no specific uh, cure for rabies. However, once the bite has, has been uh, made, then um, washing and rinsing the area with the water and soap thoroughly almost 15 minutes is very important. Then applying uh, disinfectant, you can apply things like iodine, then do not stitch the area and then administer a tetanus toxin vaccine. If somebody's bleeding, you'll have to put a pad of gauze until the bleeding stops and then you can remove it. So this is the washing uh, with soap. Try not to stitch it, applying the disinfectant and getting a tetanus shot. Then from there, then giving anti-rabies vaccine. Uh, this is uh, very important and we normally have a schedule, a five, um, five dose uh, schedule intramuscularly given uh, in day zero, three, seven, 14 and 28. So within a month, we should be done with the, with the vaccination. This is for a person who has never been vaccinated against um, rabies. However, if you have actually been vaccinated against it previously, you just get two booster shots of at day zero and day three. 
uh, other than that, then they, there's just other management, um, like uh, isolating the patient in a very quiet room where we don't have a lot of light, noise, or cold because this might lead to convulsions. Then we have um, pain uh, management uh, for the anxiety and the irritation. We give sedatives, antibiotics, especially for the wound area. And then respiratory support because we said respiratory muscles might be affected to the point that we they are not functioning well. So we may need even to give oxygen. So prevention and control include things like um, now for those people taking care of these patients, uh, face masks, uh, complete PPEs basically, apron gloves, and uh, for those who have bruises and cuts to uh, try not to actually uh, take care of this patient. So pre-exposure prophylaxis, especially. Uh, for people who are coming into contact with animals or work with animals or taking care of patients who have rabies. And then post-exposure prophylaxis uh, using the normal schedule you've just talked about after exposure. Uh, immunization of these animals, killing um, wild and stray dogs, just do euphemism. And uh, euthanasia actually, yeah, they, uh, they just kill uh, all stray dogs. Then early detection and treatment and uh, surveillance and notify when uh, any case of rabies has been reported, okay? So this is the pre-exposure uh, prophylaxis. Uh, then they just given um, three dosages, uh, day zero, three, and day 21 or day 28. And it's given normally uh, two years apart or annually. Uh, Post-exposure prophylaxis is the normal schedule that we use a uh, five day uh, five uh, doses of intramuscular injection thank you so much so that was uh